Another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. I'm Ian Jessup. And I'm Corey Elland. Today we're going to talk to a mother whose life changed forever in May of 2013 when her two-year-old daughter, Dahlia, was diagnosed with an aggressive brain tumor. Joining us from Florida is Mariah Barnhart, Dahlia's mother and the founder and CEO of an organization called Cannamoms. Mariah, good of you to do this. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, guys. What you're doing is really important on a global scale. Now, three and a half years after Dahlia was first diagnosed with brain cancer, how is she doing today? She's doing wonderfully. She's above and beyond, I think, any medical professional's expectations. She's regained her childhood. She's recently been enrolled in school. And most importantly, she's living the majority of her day um, happy, playing, and pain-free, just like any six-year-old should. If it wasn't for cannabis, would your daughter be alive today? Um, I think that the statement is very broad when I say that I truly don't believe my daughter would be alive today without cannabis, because I think there's a lot more to it than face value. But when people really take a deep look at this and take into consideration all factors that are involved in the deaths um, from these critical illnesses, but particularly from cancers and the treatments and symptoms and side effects of both the disease and the treatments, it's, it's a very true statement to me that I believe wholeheartedly. What type of brain cancer did she have? Uh, she was originally diagnosed by five of the United States leading hospitals with something called pilomyxoid astrocytoma with a note on that diagnosis that it was moving more aggressively than the grade of cancer normally denotes. She was diagnosed by St. Jude Children's Research Hospital with anaplastic pilocytic astrocytoma, which is similarly to the pilomyxoid, a mixed grade, high and low grade brain tumor. Now, take us back to that fateful day in May of 2013. What symptoms was Dahlia experiencing that prompted you to take her to the doctor? Honestly, on the days leading up to diagnosis, Dahlia just had flu-like symptoms. Um, The day prior to taking her to the emergency room, she spiked a fever that ended up staying to the following day. She then began um, vomiting and was having tremors as if she had maybe low blood sugar or something to that effect. Knowing um, some of the previous symptoms that she was suffering from for many years, things that you didn't initially link together, things that neither the doctors nor I linked together, like she never slept for more than a couple hours um, at a time. Doctors initially, you know, kind of brush you off when you make statements like that. But after long enough of pushing towards a diagnosis, they would diagnose a two-year-old with ADHD or ADD, and they would be willing to prescribe psychotropic psychiatric medication, which is their only approach to treating a diagnosis like that. She was doing things like falling off of the bed, which is generally seen as something neurological. She was for quite some time waking up in the middle of the night with tremors, which we have a history of diabetes and hypoglycemia in my family. So I definitely attributed it to that and even took it upon myself to test her blood sugar at home in the middle of the night when that would happen. And um, her blood sugar was not out of range, so that was very odd. Um, But these things really, they were so far spread apart. And um, things like not sleeping, I had become accustomed to since she had never really slept, ever. But really, I think that once this became acute, once the rest of the symptoms started to surface, it was very obvious that something was very wrong. I had already asked for a brain scan. I mean, if a doctor is going to be willing to diagnose a child with a diagnosis such as ADD or ADHD, it's my strong and firm belief that you should have some kind of physical evidence of that. Um, These psychiatric diagnosis and the very dangerous psychiatric medications that come along with them was something that I happened to be lucky enough to be very privy to from a very young age. So long before cannabis, long before, you know, any knowledge of any medicinal benefits of that particular plant, I was already very well educated on what psychiatric drugs do and don't do. Um, The fact that we don't know how they work or don't work and that they come with this huge array of side effects from homicide to suicide, psychosis, et cetera. Um, I was not willing to put my daughter on medication for that. They were not willing to give her a brain scan. So when this became acute, when she began to have symptoms of a flu, but then also had these slight tremors, 
I took her into the emergency room after the pediatrician's office closed and said she was having seizures because if a child seizes, they have to do a CAT scan. So, of course, they immediately did a CAT scan. And, um, you know, poor guy that drew the short straw to come in and tell me that there was a huge mass in my daughter's brain. He looked um, like he was going to pass out himself. Uh, we were rushed by ambulance to another hospital. The second hospital had a team of neurosurgeons come in in the middle of the night. They came in and said that without a biopsy, they could tell me that they were absolutely certain this was cancerous by the size of it. Um, by the way that it looked on the MRI, we had now done a CAT scan at the original hospital and an MRI at the second hospital. So um, the following morning, they went in and did a biopsy, put in a drain, you know, to drain out some of the pressure that comes with a, a large brain tumor. Uh, we had <laughs> neurosurgeons from a third hospital come in and tell us that uh, this was very urgent, that her condition was so critical that if they didn't do surgery immediately to try to remove at least some of this tumor, that the size and pressure alone were going to kill her. So that the surgery that they were about to do on her was extremely life-threatening and she was not likely to make it through the surgery, but that if I didn't sign off on it, they would take her and do the surgery without my consent. Um, and they would be taking custody of her at that point. Wow. Obviously, you know, you're in shock. You you want to save your child's life. You're there in an emergency situation. Your world has literally um, turned upside down overnight. You're no longer concerned about school and academics and work and all of your educational aspirations, hopes and dreams for for how you're going to live your life and what you're going to do with it become completely irrelevant. And you're entirely focused on saving your child. You know, it came to my attention after that statement and her undergoing this surgery that I would have little to no options in the care of my own child from this point forward. Still in a state of shock, that was that was not on the top of my list of priorities to address at that exact moment. She underwent that surgery and did make it out alive. So the fact that she lived through something so crucial and life threatening far overshadowed the fact that she came out of it with paralysis, with severe brain damage, unable to eat, walk, or talk. She lived, and I knew at that point we had an opportunity to do something to try to save her. That was where we got this um, diagnosis from St. Jude and decided to go to this leading, global leading research hospital for children where we were given the exact same options that we would have been given anywhere else in America the and, and in a lot of countries, right? The only options for cancer are surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. But the difference between a child and an adult diagnosis is as an adult, you get to decide what to and not to do. With a child, the state would gladly take custody of that child and have them to undergo those conventional treatments without their parent by their side. So you're pretty much making a choice between um, trying to refuse treatment, which at this time I can't say that I would have done. I certainly am not going to say that, but I am going to say that I deserved rights and options in her care. So you have the choice of either, you know, blindly following what doctors are telling you, which in this state of acute shock, that's oftentimes what we do. And I'm, and, and I'm pretty confident that the doctors that were surrounding her at this time that we had gone to St. Jude were the best of the best in the world. But still, as medical professionals, your hands are tied to federal law, right? So with that being said, my other option would have been to try to refuse some form of treatment and the state would have taken custody of her. Again, I was very lucky to have a team of doctors who were not entirely against me having some say in the treatment of my daughter. So when I refused radiation, they actually had the board of St. Jude convene and agree with my decision that she would have suffered such extensive brain damage at such a young age that she would have been a vegetable. The sad thing about that to me that if I had not spoken up, how many parents don't understand what radiation is, full cranial spinal radiation more more exactly, but any form of radiation to the brain causes brain damage. And I just happen to be lucky enough to know and understand a little bit about radiation and particularly radiation on the brain to say that this was absolutely not a viable option for her. And then the board of St. Jude was kind enough to make a special you know, meeting to convene on this. And they totally agreed with me. And that saved my daughter from that type of severe brain damage. You know, I can say some of the downfalls and some of the upsides to these coincidences during our journey that I happen to know that. But at the same time, we do know that these chemotherapies that are made to be able to break the blood brain barrier in order to treat a brain tumor, 
um, chemotherapy doesn't differentiate between healthy and unhealthy cells. So it does cause brain damage. While it's killing those cancerous cells, it's killing your healthy cells. So what type of brain damage did she suffer from that initial surgery and from that chemotherapy? We'll never know because a brain tumor also causes brain damage. The pressure and buildup from that mass in your brain also cause brain damage. So it's kind of a cumulative effect. And it's hard to really pinpoint if we're going to be intellectually honest and not just say, um, you know, cannabis cures everything and conventional medicine's horrible and those types of things. For me, I try to really meet in the middle. I do understand uh, conventional medicine, but I do know also that my daughter was on her deathbed suffering more than I've ever seen any living thing suffer, much less a human being, a small helpless child. After undergoing this surgery, these chemotherapies, she was in such bad shape. She was on so many medications. You know, after brain surgery, you're very prone to seizures. My daughter, unfortunately, did suffer those. First week at St. Jude, she stopped breathing for the second time, couldn't be resuscitated, heart stopped, very prolonged resuscitation, then rushed into another emergency surgery at an additional hospital while still intubated from that, how much pain you would have to be in, how poorly your body's doing, how you are literally on your deathbed. At that moment, they're concerned with starting that chemotherapy to try to kill off some of those cancer cells. So while recovering from brain surgery after brain surgery, from drilling through the skull, from your entire body shutting down, you're then being bombarded with these chemotherapy drugs that in one respect, I can say that these medical professionals certainly saved my daughter's life. But in another respect, I know full well that we have to do better. The way that we're doing this is so risky and so barbaric. There has to be a better way. Just the simple fact that all of these treatments also kill healthy cells, cause severe and permanent um, brain damage, irreparable uh, vision loss, kidney damage, organ damage, heart failure. These kinds of things are unacceptable. So in an acute phase, I'm so appreciative of everyone who took part in saving my daughter's life. But knowing the immense amount of suffering, the fact that she was on things like morphine from the opium fentanyl, which is a hundred times stronger than morphine. All of these conglomerate of different really harsh medications from multiple seizure medications, all of which come with the same symptoms and side effects as psychiatric meds and many of the other um, chemotherapy drugs, the pain meds. She was on at least a dozen medications that were completely wiped off the table the day I started her on cannabis. So all of these medications that did not work, sure, fentanyl is going to get her high as a kite, but she was still having breakthrough pain. It wasn't like a holistic treatment. So all of these pain medicines, antiemetics for nausea and vomiting that never work, these kids are vomiting every 50 minutes. They're losing so much weight that they're unable to walk, atrophy of their muscles, and having to get feeding tubes installed. When your body's already trying to kill fast-growing cells because it has chemotherapy in it, and then you're cutting into those bodies. And all of these children that we're watching pass away from heart attacks, heart failure, organ failure, most of the kids that I've personally seen now on this journey over the last few years pass away are passing away from symptoms and side effects of the treatment. And to watch a child go into remission and no longer have cancer and then see them suffer the long-term symptoms and side effects of treatment and then pass away, not from cancer, but from heart failure, from organ failure, from a secondary cancer, which is listed side effects of these treatments. Uh, we have to do better. Sorry to interrupt. I just want to read uh, something that you wrote on childhood cancer and death, which I think was, is very apropos. You said the lucky survivors will not likely live their full lifespan. They will suffer later from cancers and the very treatment meant to save them. They will suffer depression, anxiety, PTSD, chronic pain, brain damage, organ damage. They will have difficulty obtaining life insurance, and they're likely to have difficulty maintaining relationships, and they are unlikely to be able to have healthy children of their own one day. Parents will endure right alongside their child severe PTSD, depression, and anxiety, hundreds of sleepless nights, months of nonstop crying, screaming, and vomiting, knowing that your baby is far too young to understand why you went from being their protector to their abuser overnight, or why the comfort of their parents' loving arms suddenly betrays them to hold them down to be tortured by strangers in masks. In the eyes and heart of a young child, there is no difference between being severely abused by their once-loving parents and undergoing the horrors of treatment.
I found that uh, that was very moving because one thing that I don't think people really understand is not only what children go through during their treatment, but what parents go through. How did your son, who was 10 years old at the time, deal with all this? My son, I can say, has been a hero in my eyes with standing alongside us to kind of garner an understanding of where his sister's at, what's helping and not helping, and then going and advocating for that. Um, I mean, we moved into a new house, and his first conversation with the neighbor, with me not present, was, hey, did you know that marijuana is actually medicine? So I feel that, you know, it's crushing, and it's, it's extremely difficult and devastating and traumatic for the siblings of these children. My son's first words to me after his sister was diagnosed was, I just don't want her to die before she knows how many friends she has and how many people love her. Um, So these are the kinds of things that statement alone told me how many sleepless nights he had spent thinking about what the death of his sister would mean for her. Mm -hmm. And that's very selfless of a 9, 10, 11, now 12-year-old. But they do. They become very selfless almost instantaneously. They are as entirely consumed with the life of their sibling as the parents are. Um, eventually, of course, that that changes and you do, do see a lot of a lot of these siblings become very misbehaved, very reaching for attention. You know, any attention is, is good attention in the eyes of someone who's neglected because those siblings generally do become neglected. It, I mean, it's just it's traumatizing for the entire family. Every family member suffers in some way, in a way that really can't be understood unless you've experienced it or have enough empathy as a human being to really put yourself in those shoes. Mariah, when you were dealing with uh, Dahlia's chemotherapy, how did you discover cannabis? Well, I believe this is about the time when that CNN documentary had come on and it had become a little more widely accepted and mainstream versus, you know, prior to that, it would have been a big conspiracy theory by some crazy activists, right? But I think that we were at a point by t- end of 2013 that that was definitely shifting. Um, I've always been very well educated on naturopathic and holistic medicine, but I also am very much also involved in traditional and conventional medical communities. I my godparents did not have children of their own, and I was very close with my godmother. And when I was 20 years old, um, I would stay overnight with her so that my godfather could continue to work and um, watched her pass away from breast cancer. And the entire reason that she passed away, in my opinion and in the opinion probably of any educated medical professional, is because she wouldn't seek help. Um, she definitely wanted to do it a natural route. Breast cancer um, across the board almost entirely is 100% curable at stage zero and stage one. So, you know, really we're advocating here for early detection. But at that time, obviously we didn't know about cannabis oil. So had that been a viable option, I am, I'm entirely positive that we could have convinced her to go that route and try this option. Um, she was going to Mexico, trying frequency therapies and this and that. And, you know, cannabis oil just was not a known thing. If it had been, we would have known about it because she spent her entire life in the naturopathic community. And that's probably why I spend so much of my time speaking out and advocating. I think it's it's normal for people to, you hear your voice on the radio or see yourself talk on TV and it feels really weird and it's uncomfortable. You're out of your comfort zone. And But these are the things that we have to do to make sure nobody else ever says, I just didn't know. Because to live with the regret of not knowing, watching her pass away and then watching the first few months of my daughter's journey and the amount of suffering that she endured, Two of the really important things that I promote are I never want another parent, caregiver, or patient to ever say, I just didn't know. I'm, I, You know, that kind of regret is something that we will always have to live with, that we can go forward and try to help somebody else from living with. And secondly, that for all of us, cannabis was a last resort. When you're backed in a corner, you have no options, and you're literally watching the worst of the worst of what can come of this life here on Earth. Um, all of a sudden, it becomes a viable option. Um, so for us, it was a last resort, and it was not a first option. So we're trying to shift that dynamic and ensure that for anyone else going forward, this is on the plate at the beginning of diagnosis, that before you were ever even diagnosed, 
you already knew about this. Um, you know, my daughter was, like I said, on so many medications. I didn't start her on cannabis until about six months into treatment when she was undergoing yet another surgery through her skull to place another shunt to drain fluid from her brain to her stomach. <clears throat> and because of her history of stopping breathing, they could not give her any pain medicines because everything they had available from the pharmacy at that hospital on hand was a respiratory suppressant. She woke up out of having her skull opened with no pain medicine. That day, I informed them that I was getting oil illegally shipped into the state. Um, it was kind of an unspoken thing that our job was to ensure the well-being of the suffering child, not arbitrary laws. First night that I started her on oil, she slept through the night for the first time in her entire life. She woke up hungry and thirsty, which, you know, hydration and nutrition are two of the most important factors in whether or not you're going to make it through diagnosis and treatment. Um, she was already looking at having to get a feeding tube. She was, um, you know, eating. She was drinking. More importantly, she was awake. She was aware. She was active. She was starting to play. Um, within that first couple of weeks, she had already gained weight, no longer at risk for a feeding tube. Three antiemetics for nausea and vomiting that never worked, taken off the table, weaned from pain meds that were very harsh, dangerous medications that never worked. Um, so right there, you have half a, do uh, half a dozen medications off the table. She was weaned off of Keppra half a year earlier than her neurologist um, wanted her to be and never had a seizure again. She really just made such a miraculous recovery within a month of starting her on oil. We left St. Jude with the agreement that I would continue her chemotherapy at home and that we would get a relationship going with a local hospital in Colorado. We relocated to Colorado. Um, you know, at this point, I think we had already spoken to some people like Corey, like Janet. Um, we had already received oil from some trusted people. I won't name names on that, but um, from across the United States. I mean, there, there's a global community of people who really stepped up to the plate to, to say, um, if this is your decision, know that you have an army behind you. And unfortunately, moving to Colorado, I also got to see the hard way that there is no real organization for sick kids um, who need cannabis, that there is no real organization for the parents that are suffering all of this trauma and going this route, this unconventional route that doesn't really have a medical team behind us. Um, and that's where Canna Moms came from. I don't like to reinvent the wheel and I always will jump on board with something amazing if it already exists. And I thought that something already existed and I was I was mistaken. So that was kind of where the formation of Canna Moms and knowing that so many other parents were going to go this route and this journey if we shared our stories. And then those people were going to need a, a, a hub of resources, of access, of community and support. And, and that's how how we got where we are today. Um, looking at these parents' stories, changing laws, I think that we've found the golden key to global revamping of these horrible laws, prohibition and the war on drugs that's killing our children. How long did uh, Dahlia continue to be on chemotherapy? So um, from that point forward, she had six months left of her initial chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. um, at the point where we stopped chemotherapy, we continued to do scans. Um, her MRIs showed that her tumor continued to shrink, eventually appearing dead. What they still to this day consider for the high-grade cells of that tumor to be dead. Her oncologist actually ended up leaving St. Jude after watching her. So initially, not even really understanding why I was asking about this as an option, she went from, from really being shocked that I would even bring this up in her hospital to ask her about it to leaving you know, the leading research hospital to going to a hospital that was doing cannabis research in another state so that she could head that up. And she's now one of that state's most vocal, educated and prominent supporters. She's on the governor's commission. She's educating other doctors, politicians. And I mean, that's kind of a statement to our actions really can change the world. One child, one patient, one person at a time. Mo, um, for the benefit of parents that are listening now um, and have a child who's sick, can you talk um, and address a little bit about... Uh, how much oil you were giving Dahlia and what you started out with and was it a high THC content and I know your your mom first contacted me in uh, September of 2013 saying she had a two and a half year old 
grandbaby with a very rare and aggressive brain tumor and that you guys were at St. Jude's and um, that she was about to undergo chemo and radiation and wanted to get pointed in the right direction because this just wasn't going to work. Yeah. Um, so, unfortunately, in my situation and a problem that we still see now, and this is a global issue, we work with families in multiple countries, There, there's no real good logistics or numbers going out to kind of help these people start. There are so many resources that it becomes almost unhelpful. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Because then you don't know where to start, who to believe. Um, I was very much against the idea of starting with a half a grain of rice or something so unscientific as that. I was very much wanting to take a specific amount of oil with a specific lab result that set a specific percentage or milligrams of THC and CBD, then in- infuse it into olive oil and create, you know, an exact, an exact dose. Yes. Um, and I was, I really stuck to that for a long time. Unfortunately, that isn't really feasible right now. Yes, you do always want to make sure if you can help it that you have tested oil, you know what's in it. Um, but truthfully, people that are are going this route oftentimes are in dire situations and they need to start on it right now. They mm-hmm. don't have what it takes to infuse something into olive oil and know the temperatures and blah, blah, blah. So at that point, it's like, well, you start with the end of a toothpick. And you work your your way up, you know, every few hours you do the end of a toothpick size, just mm-hmm. teeny tiny to make sure there aren't any bad. It's, it's a, a natural botanical. So in that case, the measuring and the numbers, yes, at some point I would like to see us further along in that. I would like to see enough reports from parents of specific diagnoses that this is where I started and this is what helped best. Um, but honestly, that starting so small as the end of a toothpick to make sure that everything's kosher and then every, you know, day or couple days from there going up just that exact same amount until you get to quarter and then a half a grain of rice and and that whole thing. Uh, unfortunately, that's really the best route we've seen for people who are getting concentrated oils and need to start today. Thank you. Do you have much resistance or do you get any resistance from parents who have cannabis suggested to them as a medical benefit for their children? Oh, sure. I mean, there's so many factors that come into play here. When you go to it, which is the exact reason that it's it's kind of hard. You know, the tinctures are heavily diluted, so it's hard to tell a parent to start on a more expensive, already infused tincture out of certain milligrams of something. And that's kind of why the concentrate um, and then working your way up from just a tiny, teeny amount, you know, as unscientific as that sounds, like I said, it is a natural, safe botanical. And so long as you're being careful and watching for symptoms and side effects, it depends on that, that child situation. If a child is happy and active and you're giving them so much oil that it's making them sleep for days, um, naturally that, that's going to be perceived as, impen- impen- you know, hurting that child's quality of life. So with critically ill children, we're always trying to balance quality of life and life. If a child is not active and they're in a lot of pain and you're giving them enough oil to sleep, then you're doing them a favor, right? So that's one is that the public perception of how you're affecting that child's ability to function, to play, what their quality of life already is versus what it would be if given, you know, a lower or higher dose of something, depending on what you're trying to treat from seizures to cancer um, to MS and uh, in children, cerebral palsy, things of that nature. But secondly, even in a legal state, you can have DCF called on you and lose your child for giving them cannabis. Just because it's a legal plant to grow or use in that state doesn't mean that DCF doesn't look at it as child abuse. So there is one really important thing that parents need to know. And secondly, in an illegal state, obviously, at that point, you're risking losing your child and being imprisoned. And then you have things like whether you're in a legal or illegal state, you're going to have so many differing medical opinions. I have only found that doctors who are extremely uneducated on cannabis dislike the idea of a child using it. Doctors who are more educated on it are obviously much more open-minded to it. But when you find an open-minded doctor, you're not always going to find one who's going to say, I'm going to sign off on this. They're going to say, I'm going to look the other way. When I came home to Florida, I took one of the other moms here with um, to an appointment at a local hospital. And I told them, you know, you have to document that she's using this. We're not going to do the don't ask, don't tell. I'm telling you that I'm using it. It's part of her treatment. 
and it has to be charted. Um, so at that point, now we've had several other families of this hospital that's now partnered with a global leading hospital charting that these children are using this. You know, it's not the medical professional's job to enforce a law when you can see that that parent is doing what is absolutely best and right for that child. So things are definitely changing, but it's important for parents to take these things into consideration because like I said, there's a huge difference. I work with patients of all ages, always have and always will. Like I said, my first real experience with the heartache of cancer was when I was 20 watching my godmother, who I love so dearly suffer so immensely um but cannabis moms was so important to exist to focus on children needing cannabis because there are so many differences between me as an adult choosing this route and me as a parent choosing to give it to my child and dcf legality hospitals um those things all become an entirely different thing when you're treating a child with it you know, uh, Corey sent me uh, a video of you and Dahlia last night, and it was – what was the video? Was it for uh, legalized marijuana in the state? The one that you just posted, I think, is for, for awareness and legalizing in Florida. Is that correct, Mo? Well, that one was actually a nationwide – and I think that they, they obviously put that video out globally and nationwide – um, we're obviously going to use it here in Florida. We're allowing the people who are putting out stuff for this amendment, mm-hmm. um, but the same is for anyone in any state or any country that wants to show a politician or their neighbors who are voting on something how and why this is so important to them. Um, that's for, for anyone to use. And, you know, on that note, obviously, from my standpoint, all I can do is tell my story. I'm not a medical professional. I'm not a lot of other things, but I'm somebody who's experienced this firsthand and telling my story is what I have to give the world to try to make sure no other parent can ever say, I just didn't know. But someone like you, Corey, um, being available, being a rock, someone that that people can reach out to the way I know that you have to be immensely. And I know this because parents reach out to me all the time and I'm so emotionally drained because every child deserves and every patient deserves all of my time and all of my help. But I'm one person and each of these people volunteering their help and time as we grow and get bigger, each of them is only one person. And it's heartbreaking and devastating when you get close to these families and then lose someone to any of these devastating illnesses. Um, But I do just want to take a moment during this interview to say for someone like Corey, so early in the journey, being so educated and so willing to be open and share that information, like you said, when my mom reached out, and then I'm sure subsequently you and I have um, spoke not that long after that, because I've known you now for years. Um, But what you do is so important. Um, With this radio show, both of you spreading that awareness and that education is so key to a global shift in our perception so that we can change laws. Um, But also being that rock, Corey, is, is something that so many people should be thanking you for every single day. Well, I thank her every single day. Every single day she's here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mariah. I appreciate that. That's uh, very kind of you. One of the things that when Corey and I got together to do this radio program, uh, we wanted to bring the stories that uh, Corey has experienced uh, through Facebook over the last number of years. And she's done it for free. She's helped people all around the world, thousands of people all around the world. And what we want to do with this radio program is to take the message all around the world and listen to stories like yours and others who have used cannabis for medical benefit and try and get this demonization of marijuana out of the public's mind because I think it has been used for thousands of years. Nobody has ever died from taking too much marijuana or too much cannabis, and it has incredible health benefits and that's why we have the endocannabinoid system within our body there's something about well, this and I plant. Know firsthand right or wrong i know some of these things firsthand because i was just an everyday average mom in the situation i was in and i had an entire lifetime background from all of the leading women in my life that we didn't have medicine and very naturopathic and all of this and I still didn't know what cannabis was, nor would I have even believed it was medicine unless somebody brought something like a real life human experience to my table and said, this is, this is, you know, my personal experience. And when enough people start doing that, it shifts something. Because for me, when it was first brought to me, 
it wasn't something I would have looked hard at. It wasn't, you know, a lot of the stories seemed like they could easily be poked holes in. And, you know, the people, they want someone that looks and sounds like them that they can relate to. So you get enough different people, enough different ages, enough different stories out, and everybody can find one that they totally relate to. And, and it's just really important. Yeah. Mariah, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you so much for taking the time out to do this. Oh, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate everything you do. And we really appreciate you speaking out and speaking up and um, giving parents out there some hope. Of course, she's a wonderful mother. And uh, you first met her through her, her mother. Did you? Through her mother, yes. In 2013. Yeah, in yeah. September of 2013. This is one of your victories? This is one of my victories. Yeah. You bet. Many of your thousands of victories. Uh, that's it for another episode of Cannabis Health Radio. We'll be back tomorrow and we have a fascinating guest tomorrow uh, robert platchorn who is he was sentenced to 64 years in prison for smuggling marijuana and now he helps seniors uh, throughout florida that's tomorrow on cannabis health radio you've been listening to the cannabis health radio podcast visit our website CannabisHealthRadio.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.